Hello, this is Mark Anderson speaking to you from Minneapolis, headquarters of Stadies Incorporated. And I'm going to be pre presenting graphical methods for selecting factorial effects. What's in it for you? Let's go ahead and start the show. So just a little bit about my background. I'm engineering consultant. Uh, I'm a professional chemical engineer and also a certified quality engineer. And then along the way, I picked up my master in business administration. And I just love these graphical methods because they're very visual and make it a lot simpler than just trying to use numbers. So welcome everyone. To make the most from this webinar, uh, I've got you on mute. Uh, if you put in chat, I may not get to it till afterwards, but I will follow up at the end with any questions that come in on chat, or if you want to come on mic with questions at the end, I'd be happy to address those. Also, if you prefer, send questions to me directly to my email at mark at .com. By the way, this presentation will be posted at our website in our webinars page. All right, uh, if you're with me, please press the raise hand button on your control panel. All right, thanks Wayne, Wolfgang. Those of you that have attended my presentations in the past, Kenneth, you know my drill here. Uh, I just wanna make sure that you're out there, the internet is working and everything's going smooth. Thanks for that feedback. Okay, so let's begin. So the goal of this webinar is to provide you know something that's in it for you in graphical approaches and how these help you assess effects at a glance which is a huge advantage over tables of statistics which oftentimes are very off-putting and in particular getting an appreciation for how our software design expert and statis 360 provides excellent graphical tools for selecting effects from two-level factorial designs, multi-level categoric designs, which also are known as general factorials, and then split plots, which include hard to change inputs. We have a pretty clever uh, implementation of graphical effect selection for the split plots. And uh, we can deal with having unreplicated two-level factorials, for example, for screening, but if you include replication, like you do for characterization designs with replicated center points, we have an aid for you to deal with that pure error to help you, you know, even further select the effects. And our software can handle missing data, non-orthogonal levels, you know, by design or, you know, by botched levels. So in the end, then we can help you make better decisions to sort out the vital few effects from the trivial many. All right, if that sounds good, uh, give me the thumbs up and we'll just get a little bit more feedback. Okay, great. And uh, so I've got a few, I call them the canaries in the coal mine uh, that are giving me some feedback. So I appreciate that Wayne, Kenneth, and those of you that are uh, pressing up the buttons are helping me make sure that I'm on the right track here. But of course, I assume that if you signed up for this presentation and you're here live for it, then you're probably pretty positive about these ideas. But for those of you that are not as familiar with these graphical selection methods, the number one tool that's super useful for two level or other types of factorial designs as have been implemented by Stati's inventors is the half normal plot, also known as the Daniel plot, after the inventor Cuthbert Daniel in 1959, who published this article in Tectometrics on the use of half normal plots in interpreting factorial two level experiments. So, this was a very innovative way to graphically judge, as he said, the reality of the observed effects. And so, I like to consider the ones that are identified as being active effects and the ones that aren't as being inactive. So the way it works is shown here with an output from design expert that I'll uh, demonstrate for you in just a minute. Um, to begin with, 
pay attention to the bottom axis, the x-axis, where it's showing the absolute value of the effect. Now, the word standardized, don't let that put you off, but that is just a way that we handle missing data or non-orthogonal designs. This happens to be a two-level design that's completely orthogonal, so whether it's the actual effect or the standardized effect doesn't matter. But the fact that it's an absolute value means that we want to focus on the bigger effects, the ones off to the right. Now, on the other side of things, on this y-axis, we've got a specialized scale that is essentially taken from a Z normal table, but then because it's the absolute value, it's known as a half normal as, as opposed to a full normal. Now consider that we have a bell-shaped curve and we fold it over so that we only have the right side of it. Then going back to our x-axis, you realize that we have zero uh, level and these near zero effects are the ones that are lined up because of the special y-axis. So the y-axis is specialized so that effects that are normally distributed, which are what we call the near zero effects, will line up and we would call these the trivial many effects, these little effects here. And this is actually one population of effects that re essentially represents the, the error you know, the variation in your system, you know, caused by the process, the sampling, and the test. Now, if we mind the gap that we see here, then we see beyond this lineup of small effects near zero, so effects that stand out, and the biggest one, if we want to keep our eyes on the prize, in this particular case, is a main effect of A, which happens to be the temperature in this process. And then as we continue to pick off effects, we see the next biggest one is actually an interaction of A with C, which is a concentration, which also stands alone as a main effect. And then we have next the AD interaction, which includes the parent term D, which is chosen also as one of the main effects. So we have an interesting little family of effects here that involve A, C and D, and two of the children, which are the AC and the AD interaction. And this is representative of a fairly sophisticated situation that's only revealed by doing uh, the two level combinations. You would never see this by doing just one factor at a time. So this is our beginning point, and I'll demonstrate this, this example in just a minute. However, there's a second graphical uh, tool that we, we like, and I would go to this as our next tool. Uh, and that's going to be something called a half normal plot. And just kind of previewing ahead here, uh, the Pareto plot is what I wanted to show. It's going to come up in just a minute. But just before we get off the half normal plots, uh, there was a big debate on the graphical selection methods as opposed to numerical methods back in 2015 in this Journal of Quality Technology. And I was happy to see that in the further discussion on these Daniel plots or half normal plots, that a number of people stood up for using graphical methods against, you know, just using numerical methods. And one of them was this David Steinberg, who was a student of George Vox. And George Vox, uh, along with Stu Hunter and Bill Hunter, popularized these half normal plots in their 1979 book, Statistics for Experimenters. And so they really promoted these tools, and that's how Statis got going with them using the 1979 book by George Box as kind of the Bible and creating our first software design ease back in 1982. But as uh, Steinberg uh, lays out, these half normal plots are actually easy to produce. And I show uh, how to do it in my book, in, it, which is called DOE Simplified. And so I actually, at the beginning of the DOE Simplified book, show how you can produce these plots fairly easily if you have the right kind of you know graph paper, they give you a quick visual effects of the uh, quick visual of the important effects, and the effects can, can be compared to a reference, which are these near zero contrasts that emanate from the origin, and they can be adapted to split plot experiments, as I'll show you. And so Daniel says the greatest uh, uh, Steinberg says the greatest single advantage of the Daniel plot is its ability to simulate discussion by encapsulating in a single display such a variety of information. 
So this is gonna be our number one tool for sorting, but now let's go to the number two tool, which is an ordered bar chart, also known as a Pareto plot. And going back and trying to determine the provenance of this plot, I, I had a little trouble trying to really find the earliest use of it, but I did see that Don Wheeler, who is an expert in statistical process control, but also wrote a book on design of experiments called Industrial uh, Understanding Industrial Experimentation back in 1987, made use of something he called a scree plot, which he likened to the rubble that you know falls off the side of a hill. And what he suggested is that you look for an elbow and uh, beyond that, the effects are the gonna be the trivial many. And before you hit that elbow are where the vital few effects occur. So this is actually a graph from uh, the, the book by um, Don Wheeler. However, what Stadis did is made it far easier to see this elbow by putting in a couple of benchmark lines. One of them that most of you be familiar with is the T value limit, which is uh, based on P being less than 0.05. But then to deal with the multiple pairwise comparisons in this ordered uh, bar chart of the effects, you really want to use the von Ferroni correction to be strictly correct on that p-value. So the, the way that we interpret this, by the way, we've set this up to actually show the t-value of the effect, so that way we can deal with missing data or non-orthogonal matrices and things like that. But the way you want to look at this is anything below this black line would be the trivial many for sure. And anything above the red line would definitely be part of the vital few that we're trying to identify the active effects. And then in between is kind of a, a gray area. I generally recommend even picking uh, effects that are above this T value limit, provided their main effects in two factor interactions. If their three factor interactions are higher, then I'd be more reluctant uh, because those probably are not uh, actual effects. But that's an, another consideration that gets into a little bit more interpretation than I want to get into at this point. So the enhancements are that we have these two limit lines. We also provide color coding so that we know which you know effects are positive or negative, but we're really concerned about the absolute value of the effects. And then these plots are also interactive as well as the half normal plot. And I'm going to feature that now. So if you're ready to see a little demonstration of these two key effect plots, the half normal and the Pareto, you know, give me a thumbs up or a hands up or some indication that we're ready to take a look at this demo. All right, David, thank you. And others, okay, great. Merrick Makafui, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, and so forth, Scott, and et cetera. So that's that's great. I appreciate your feedback on that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to toggle over, and I'm going over to Design Expert, and that's the package I'm going to use. This one is our core package. It's been around for many, many years. I mentioned in 1982, uh, DesignEase came out, uh, and Stadies was set up as a business with the state of Minnesota, we incorporated in 1985. And then in the late 1980s, we added in response surface methods and mixture design for optimal formulation. And we called that package Design Expert. And eventually Design Expert, you know, became the flagship product. And over the years, we finally retired Designies. Now we've come full circle and at the beginning of 2022, we came out with a more advanced package, which is called Stadis 360, and I, I'm pulling up this package now. And this package is a superset of Design Expert, but what's nice about it is it includes these uh, Python uh, add ins, so you can add scripts and then you can magnify the uh, advantages of Design Expert by making use of these free shareware packages out in the world under Python. So, those of you that are more advanced uh, would want to consider using the Stadis 360. The other thing we have with Stadis 360 FYI is we have a set of designs which are called space filling designs, including Latin, Latin hypercube designs. 
And these designs are particularly good for deterministic simulations like you would have with what are called computer experiments. So these are also very useful, especially if you're working with, let's say, finite element analysis simulators and things like that. But the majority of the people that are going to be using our tools will be perfectly served by design expert. And this would be the tool for industrial R&D scientists and engineers, such as myself in my background, coming out of specialty chemical R&D. This would be just a tool for me as a process development engineer. So let's first take a look at uh, a tutorial file. Uh, goes over a case study from a book by Douglas Montgomery. Um, and this book is called Design and Analysis of Experiments. So this would be probably the book to go to nowadays um, since Box and Hunter uh, are no longer updating and Montgomery has continued on, you know, carrying the torch forward. In this little case study, he goes through four uh, process factors, temperature, pressure, concentration, stir rate, in the form of a two-level design. So I'll get out of this and then I'm going to open up the associated file called Filtrate. All right, and then in the notes, it reminds us that this comes from the Montgomery book. The way this is built up, is using our handy design builder which has got the white diagonal of full factorials and then once you get to five or more factors then you might consider cutting back to fractions because there's a go-ahead green design that's a high resolution for example with five factors that would be perfectly good for just looking at main effects and two-factor interactions and as you get to more and more factors you can cut back even further for example i like this eight factor and 16 run option which is a yellow design to run that first as a screening and then follow up perhaps, you know, with fewer effects that are identified from the first phase and do a characterization. Now this one though has only four factors. And so it's being done as a full factorial. So I'm going to cancel back out of this and re reopen it. And then let's see what happens. So the design is created and it's laid out in a randomized run plan. And it's basically just all the possible combinations of all the factors at low and high. So this is a pretty simple, straightforward two level design. We've collected the results. And so now we're ready to rock and roll and see if anything emerges as significant. So we'll go ahead and start this analysis and I'll, I'll bring up the half normal plot to begin with. So here it is. And what I would suggest is we start with the biggest effect and then work our way back. Now, originally the line that we had was just, you know, set up in kind of a least square fit fashion, but in newer versions, we have a much more intelligent preset of the line and it's set up at the 50th percentile of the effects basically, which already gives you a pretty good view of which effects are standing off to the right. So now I've uh, picked these effects off to the right, and these are going into the model. And so therefore in this effect list, they're labeled as M. And you can see, as we saw before from my slide, that we've got a series of main effects, A, C, and D, but also two two-factor interactions that are you know, made up of these main effects and they form you know, nice little families. Okay, now what about the Pareto chart? I would suggest that after you pick the effects using the half normal, and you don't really need to look at this numeric list, but it does remind you that what you've done is picked effects for your model. And then it also tells you that the other effects are being thrown into the error pool. So we'll be able to run an analysis of variance. But then I would go to the Pareto plot and on here then we see the effects that have been chosen uh, in a different uh, way that is more compelling. And so I generally would take this and I probably would copy it over. I would copy this view of the effect selection over to say PowerPoint. And then you could do a little work to you know, annotate and modify this thing a little bit. 
Now with this view, I, I see that we have positive effects now are the orange ones and the blue ones are the negative effects. But oftentimes I might uh, uh, not show this legend and just copy it out this way. And then tell people, you know, when I present, you know, which effects are which. Okay, now the other thing is that this is an interaction, interactive plot, but the trouble with this plot is it's a little bit flaky when you're picking because as you pick the effects, it changes the T value limit and the Von Ferroni limit. But ultimately, you could use this to select. But I much prefer using the half normal plot. Now, what's nice about the half normal plot is we can actually drag and we can lasso these puppies off to the right all at once. And so this would be a shortcut. It'd be quicker than just doing it one factor at a time. All right, uh, I'm just gonna stop for a second here and just see if anybody wants to throw in a chat or come on mic. Um, so if you're interested in, in asking a question, you can put your hand up or you can type in a chat. Okay, here's one. Uh, how are the non-significant effects calculated? Um, so there's a calculation of the effects, which is basically the average of the highs versus the average of the lows. And it's summarized in this column that says standardized effects. So when you compare the average of the high temperatures to the average of the low temperatures, you're getting 21.625. You could do the same thing for the mean effect of pressure at 3.125, et cetera. And then as you lay out the, the matrix for the A, B, A, C, A, D, it's simply the multiplication of the pluses and minuses of the parent terms. And you can lay out an entire spreadsheet, but the computer can calculate that very quickly. So basically it takes all these standardized effects and it ranks them from low to high uh, against this Y axis so that each effect represents a certain cumulative percentile. And then when we look at the end result of it, we see that most of the effects are near the zero level. Typically 80% of the two factor interactions and main effects will be near zero and maybe 20% would be off to the right. Uh, on this plot, and those would be the, the vital few effects. So what I would suggest uh, for you uh, and others is you may want to study, you know, how this half normal plot is is presented. There's also a simpler uh, plot called a full normal plot that where the z axis is totally connected to the z table in terms of the percentiles. So 50 would be at the middle of the bell shaped curve, plus or minus one would be uh, encompassing two thirds of the data, plus or minus two would be 95%, and plus or minus three would be 99.5 or, or something like this. So the, the y axis is actually linear in z scale. And in this incarnation, we're showing both the negative and the positive. However, it's much simpler to pick off the half normal because it's anchored at the zero level, and you only have one degree of freedom on the slope of this line, which relates to the pooled variation that you're pulling together from these insignificant effects. And, uh, and so this plot is more user friendly. And so we recommend using the normal plot for your selector and then using the Pareto plot as a view of what happened and then using that in your report um, is what I would recommend. So there's a lot of issues here. Uh, continue to bring those questions in, but maybe throw them into the market at studies.com. But I do think that it takes some study if you're not familiar with this. And so I'd recommend, well, the original Cuthbert Daniel paper for the half normal plot. Um, I would also recommend uh, the DOA simplified book. I would recommend the Box and Hunter textbook or the Doug Montgomery book on design and analysis of experiments uh, for getting some background. Furthermore, in the program, uh, there is help available under this screen tips. And there's some discussion about how to use this half normal plot there. Uh, we also uh, provide help in the software. So there's lots of help available in the software on our website, in fact, and then various textbooks uh, that will help you um, 
identify you know what needs to be done with these plots and how they're created. All right, I'm going to uh, continue on at this point then. And by the way, also this uh, presentation is being recorded and it'll be posted up to our YouTube channel if you'd want to go back and, and review some of the parts of it that I'm presenting. Okay, so now what happens next is we take the effects that we've selected on the half normal and viewed on the Pareto, and we throw those four effects into this analysis of variance for the model, which I identified, I showed you that it turned up as M on our effects list, you know, in, in, in the program. And then the other ones were labeled E, and that means that we're gonna throw them in as an estimate of error on what's called the residual. And so the other 10 effects are actually going in here, and literally we're accumulating um, the sums of squares, which are a function of the effect squared. We're literally uh, putting those ones labeled E, we're just adding them all up, and putting them into this line here that says residual. And there's 10 effects, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And notice that the three-factor interactions are in this error pool and also the four-factor interaction, which is not surprising because generally speaking, it's unusual to see three-factor interactions or above being active. And also we, show on this numeric list the percent contribution to the overall variance. And you'll notice that the temperature, the main effect of temperature, the main effect of concentration, stirring rate, and these two two-factor interactions involving the three parent terms are comprising most of the overall variation that's being contributed you know, to your response. And the other ones are very trivial. When you add those up, they don't add up to very much. And so that kind of confirms what we see on this half normal plot. And then, as I said, it goes into this uh, analysis of variance. And then we can see that altogether, the F value for the terms we picked in for the model are extremely significant. They're less than 0 0.0001 likely to have occurred just by chance. And this is a test of the mean square of the sums of squares compared to the mean square of the residuals. And so that's how this analysis of variance is put together. So now we know it's significant and we're good to go and press ahead. So rather than just using this numerical approach and using a technique, you know, such as a stepwise, you know, backward regression or something like that, using the graphs and then looking at the stats, is really the best of both, both worlds. That's that's my premise. And we've seen since we started up in 1982, and even before that, working with our founding principal, Pat Whitcomb and myself, presenting these tools to our R&D colleagues back, back in the day, that these graphical tools make it a lot easier for non-statisticians, the scientists, engineers working in industrial R&D, to quickly identify what, if anything, from their experiment does emerge as active. And then they can start digging in on the stats, you know, and presenting the p-values and things like that. Okay, now there's a number of innovations that have come in over the years since STATI started up in 1982 and basically just put in the most simplest half-normal plot at that point. Um, over the years, we added this preset, which I mentioned uh, is very handy to not have to, you know, figure out where to draw that line. This actually came as a result of that article that I showed you earlier, where I quoted David Steinberg. Uh, in this journal of quality technology, Doug Montgomery suggested that we do a preset. And so we implemented that back in 2015. And so the preset is, is very useful as opposed to just you know, having a least square fit of, of the original points. Um, we also sync up the picked effects with the Pareto plot or vice versa. So going back to uh, this example here, if I go to this side-by-side -side view and clear the selection, you'll see as I pick on this left side, it's picked on the right side. Okay, so that's the syncing I'm talking about. 
And then as far as, far as the preset is concerned, in earlier versions, you would see the line like this, and then it would change as you picked effects. But now our new uh, our new approach presets it so that it's pretty easy to see where that gap is. And even you might just lasso these guys over here, then you see them over there and life is good. So that's one of my favorite uh, uh, things that we see. Also, we display pure error, which reinforces a lineup of trivial effects. And I have another case from Box Hunter and Hunter, page 325, that includes center points that I'm going to open up. Let me just close out this tutorial um, information, and I'm going to close out the current design. And then I've got this Box Hunter and Hunter, page 325, with center points, and you can see. This design has center points in it. And the way this is built is not just the two to the four design, but also putting in four center points, which are mid-level points of these particular factors, catalyst, temperature, pressure concentration. By the way, we also present a power calculation if you know what the difference is you're trying to detect at a minimum and what your variation is. That's provided by the program. Reopening this file, what I've done is I've identified the space point type to add this column here. And so now you see the center points, which are the mid-level of each of the factors. Okay, so what that does is, let's look at the conversion. What that does is it gives you green triangles that are showing on the line here. And since we have four center points, we get three degrees of freedom of pure error. And that kind of reinforces that we have the trivial many lined up on the left-hand side. And in this case, temperature stands way out, but also catalyst concentration. The interaction of uh, temperature and concentration. And then there's a little effect here. I'm gonna pick this. It says it's pressure, which is a main effect. I probably would go with that. Let's see what it shows up on the Pareto chart. Okay, so that's one of those ones that's in this gray area between the T value limit and strictly speaking, the point of P of 0 0.05 pairwise corrected Bonferroni limit. And it turns out when we look at the analysis of variance, uh, well, a couple of things is that we provide a curvature check, which is very helpful. And then let's assume that uh, we stay with this model, even though it's got, you know, close to having significant curvature, but um, actually even the C effect shows up with a very low P value. So I would press ahead with that. And then using our model graphs, I might view that C effect and we would see that, well, it's a very small uh, effect. It probably isn't important. And doesn't really matter much if we include that in the model or not. But my point is actually more on the half normal plot, putting in these green triangles to represent the pure error as a really good advantage um, to reinforce the lineup of the trivial many effects. So again, um, either hold the questions till the end and I'll come back uh, or send them into marketstudies.com or throw in a chat and I'll get to that at the end. Okay, what else? Uh, we invented and it won the award for the Shul Trophy at uh, the technical conference for applying these same tools of half normal to what we call multi-level categorical factorials, which also sometimes are known as general factorials. And these are factorials that have, you know, um, treatments that are many in, in nature. And one of the examples we have is in our tutorial for a, a study from Douglas Montgomery, where he looked at a battery. And in this study, he had three different material types. So it's not a two level design. He had three different temperatures, which he treated categorically because there was a cold room, a, a, a medium temperature room, and a hot room, and he was looking at the life of the batteries, depending on the different materials, and how that changed as he had different temperatures. So I've got this 
available under our help tutorial data, and it's called Battery Life. So again, you know, in our note, we remind ourselves that this comes from Montgomery's book, Design and Analysis of Experiments. It evaluates three materials, not just two. And so where that comes into play is not in the two-level design, but in this feature here called multi-level categorical. And usually I put this in the vertical display. We type in three, and that way we can enter in, you know, the three different materials. If we had four materials, we'd enter in four for the levels. We've got three temperatures. Now I've identified those as ordinal factors because there's an order to them. And in the tutorials, there's actually a second tutorial that follows up and you can actually look at this in part two, this temperature as a numeric factor and apply a more sophisticated response surface model to it. But you'll have to go on that on your own since we don't have time in this presentation to cover all this. But what I want to show you is that once you've collected the data, we can apply this graphical selection tool to look at it on the half normal plot, which is pretty cool. So now when we start this analysis, you'll see, well, we have only the half normal plot, there's no Pareto plot, but that's pretty good. And what we do with the uh, general factorials, which are, we call multi-level categoric, because they're a little bit slippery on the half normal plot because of the differing degrees of freedom that we have to contend with having more than two levels of each factor. Um, we have a preset and, and, and the preset isn't always exactly right. In this case, we can see by eye that although the computer picked the main effects of temperature and material, there's definitely a third effect standing out. And notice that all the replication is helping us here of having done this experiment over and over again. Um, in the actual buildup of the experiment, I'll just show you that. Uh, you notice right here where it says four replicates. So each set of uh, combinations here is done four times over. And going back and reopening that file, that's providing the green triangles that we see as a positioning aid. So that comes into play here and is very helpful for us to be able to see that there's actually one more effect that we should pick. And this is makes all the difference because we see that it's not only the main effects of material and temperature, but also the interaction of the two. And this turns out to be highly significant at 0.05. And then we get a much better picture of what's going on uh, here when we look at um, if we look at it with the temperature on the bottom axis, then we see the material A3, which is the blue one on the top, stands out. And we can also look at this in a 3D view, and we can see the A3, you know, is actually coming out as the best uh, across all three temperatures. So this turns out to be a very, you know, nice tool to be able to use that half normal plot and see at a glance that is not just the A and the B main effects, but also the AB interaction that stands out. Okay, last but not least, um, if you have effects uh, that are coming from a split plot, they have to be handled in a different way than from a, a totally randomized design. So split plots turn out to be a very useful tool if you have hard to change factors. So I did this little experiment on a paper helicopter. This is an experiment that George Box showed me at a conference I went to in 1996 in Madison, uh, a short course, a five-day short course. And Box came in with his graduate students and he loved showing the paper helicopter experiment because it was a fun in-class experiment that you could run to see the advantage of doing multi-factor approach and not just using one factor at a time. And it's something you could do at home with a piece of paper and a scissors. So I'm going to go ahead and open up an experiment that I ran at Stadies. And the way I set it up was to save time. I chose this split plot, regular two level. And then I identified that um, certain factors were hard to change that related to the build of the experiment, which were which type of paper I used. 
the wing length was something that was harder to change, body length and body width. So basically what I did is I broke up the experiment so that the design factors in the experiment were the harder change. And then once we built the uh, helicopters, we could either put a paper clip on it or not. That was easy to change. And then we could either drop it by holding on to the bottom of it or, or at the top of it, that was easy to change. And the advantage of it, I also did a power calculation to see what would happen. The, the build factors, which are changed less often, have less power associated with it. We decided that was acceptable if we had run a totally randomized experiment, then all the different main effects that we would have estimated would have had the same power. But because we restricted the randomization, um, that caused us to lose a little bit of power on our hard to change factors. But nevertheless, the, the big advantage was that I could, could ask my uh, front office staff to go ahead and build a helicopter pointing to these parameters and they would number the helicopter, whichever we saw here for the group number. So they would write down with a, a Sharpie on the helicopter that they built with this particular paper, with that wing length, body length, and clip, uh, I'm sorry, with the body length. And then we took the helicopters in, in a random subplot. We changed whether we put the clip on or off and whether we dropped it from the top or the bottom. And so this way, we ended up saving a lot of time because there was only 16 builds of the helicopters rather than there would have been uh, 32 otherwise, 32 builds if we would have done a totally randomized plan. Okay, so now what happens? By the way, if you're interested, uh, just put in a request and I think I have a, a write-up on this experiment that I can send you. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and reopen the paper helicopter results. And these are off to the right now, you know, so we see the time of the drop here. And then when we analyze the time of the drop, what's interesting is we've, we've split up the half normal into the subplot effects. And in this subplot effects, we see the F, the drop, um, how we dropped it made a difference, which was an easy to change factor that's capitalized. We also see whether the clipper was on or off changed the flight time. And then for the whole plot effects, we see that the wing, um, the wing length made a difference. That's uh, a harder change factor that goes into the whole plot effect. So we've got two different effects here. And I think we ended up picking also this interaction of the paper type and the clip being on or off. And so now this makes our, our model that we can see the significance of the different effects here. And it goes on from there. In the end, um, I use this model to maximize the time of the drop. And I came up with a solution that says we should use a slightly heavier specialized 24 pound paper with a long wing the body length wasn't active in the model or the body width, but the clip off, you know, the, the plane, the paper helicopter would drop slower. So it had a longer time. And if we held it at the bottom, that was better. And that was the end result of it. But all I really wanted to show you in this case is that we have this innovation of having two plots, two half normal plots. And this I saw when George Box did a short course back in 19, 96 and he did the same thing he had two different half normal plots one is for the subplot and it also includes a subplot by whole plot interactions and the other plot is only for the whole plot effects which are restricted and grouped so it's quite a sophisticated situation that we're able to accommodate and this ability to handle harder change factors is huge for industrial r d experimenters for things like temperature in an oven that you can't change very easily. So I'm gonna go ahead and close off the chat for now and we're on the home stretch here the last 10 minutes and see what else I have. Okay, other clever, clever statistical features and nifty touches for the graphical selection of factorial effects. Um, I think I mentioned this a couple times, we have the standardization of the effects that you saw on the bottom axis of the half normal 
uh, on the Pareto plot, it's actually the t-value of the effects, and that's related to the standardization. And so what that does is if we have missing data, or we've altered the independent factors, you know, the levels of them, or if it's not orthogonal by design, for example, minimum run screening and characterization designs or plaquet vermin designs. And, and what's interesting about the uh, designs that we normally would work with, um, such as the um, design that I first brought up, that are strictly the two level designs, is that they're completely orthogonal. So if we go back to this uh, filtration rate, and there's different ways I can I can assess the orthogonality, but one of them that's kind of fun is if I look at this graph columns, which is just a simple scatter plot. Well, we can see that you know some of the effects like the temperature at a glance we can see are having a big main effect, but also if you look at the uh, correlation of A with B. You notice this is a purely white square. That means there's no correlation. So this is orthogonal. This is an orthogonal design. However, um, when you pull up other choices that we have, and we have very great choices um, available if you have many, many factors. Like I like to say, if you have nine factors, then the standard two level designs kind of break down the one half fraction the one quarter fraction would be the, the best we could do with 128 runs with nine factors. That would still be green, but if you go to the minimum run characterize for nine factors, we can cut down from, uh, well, let's see, what was it, 128 down to only 46 runs. However, these designs have you know a pretty flaky alias structure that's non-orthogonal. The good thing is that every main effect is alias only with three factor or higher interactions. So we make a leap of faith that whatever we see as a main effect is a main effect and not a three factor interaction. And also the two factor interactions on this nine factor minimum run resolution five are alias only with three factor interactions. However, uh, we have to do something special on our half normal plot when we collect those effects to, to contend with that. Now, also going back to the nine factor option. If you decided that even the 32 runs that we saw for the minimize uh, run characterizes too many, 46, then you could go to the yellow designs and the, the smallest design you could pick with the normal builder is 32 runs, this would be orthogonal. But if we don't wanna do 32 runs, we could go to the minimum run screen and you could do as few as 18 runs, but we recommend adding a couple extra runs. But this design also is non-orthogonal. In this case, the main effects still are alias only with three-factor interactions, but for the screening uh, minimum run, we do have to contend with the fact that interactions are alias with each other. But no worries, if you collect the data from this, uh, we'll be able to, to handle that. Uh, now, another thing that's kind of subtle is that when we do the collection of calculations for the effects, we always start with main effects, then we go with two-factor interactions and so forth. And because of the way we build this up on a hierarchical basis, if you have botched uh, levels or missing data and that type of thing, we can give you the most that you're likely to get by making an assumption that there's a normal uh, uh, occurrence of main effects being predominant, two-factor interactions being not, not, not uncommon, three-factor interactions being less common or less likely needed to do the fitting. Um, and by going forward like that, we end up giving you more likely some you know, salvage of the data that you've collected. And uh, I've got a reactor half fraction. Let's see if we, what happens with that one that I uh, built up. And on this one, uh, well, we have, on R2, we have uh, one data that's been ignored here. So that normally that would kind of unravel things. Well, let's look at all the results for the half normal. All right, now let's go to the one that has one uh, result missing. And you'll see that it gives us a message of warning that this data is now not orthogonal. And you notice that, um, well, we get 
we're still able to handle this, the results shift a little bit as we pick them because of the non-orthogonality. Isn't that interesting? But in the end, even though we've got the missing data, we're able to get essentially the same result. And so that just shows you the versatility of our program. And because of the way that we have set the algorithms up, it, it allows you to deal with situations like a botched you know, set of uh, results. Uh, what else? Uh, we could right click on selected effect to reveal aliasing if you have alias designs. We've got a very, very alias design in our tutorial, uh, which is the biker data. And this is what we call a saturated two-level design. It's one that shows up red on your design builder. And this one came from the Box Hunter and Hunter book, Statistics for Experimenters. And uh, what we're gonna see when we, we build this is that the biker decided that they had to go to the very smallest design because they didn't have much time before the race would start. So they went with the seven and eight design, which is really, really badly aliased, okay? And so that's how we created this design. Now let's go ahead and open the design. And then look at the half normal plot. Okay, now it looks like these three effects are, are active off to the right. But if we right click over it, we'll see that this E really could be B and G. And now it's actually going to show B and G when you're ready to view the model graph. Okay, so that's what B and G would look like. On the other hand, if we right click over this and change it back to E, and this is all in a little tutorial if you want to take a look at this, we could consider that this G main effect is actually B and, and E. And we'd make another little family, and now the interaction would look different. Isn't that something? So there's actually a lot of different interpretations, and rather than go through all this, I'll just tell you that if you want to dig into this, if you go to the tutorial, um, for the uh, biker example, uh, you'll be able to see exactly what's going on in, in this case and um, kind of work through this whole thing. It turns out that you can get yourself out of this problem by doing what's called a foldover, which does all the opposite levels. And by augmenting the design, you actually are able to resolve, you know, which of the alias interactions or main effects it actually is. So this would be a fun one if you have the software to go through. Uh, it's pretty cool. With the foldover, we're actually able to see ultimately, you know, what what's going on, and it turns out to be a combination of B, E, and G. You know, most likely is the conclusion when we finish this. So that's about all I can cover uh, because our main focus is just using these graphical selection tools. But just so you know that we have you know, many innovations built into the STATI software uh, to be able to contend with different situations, whether it's a standard two-level design, or it's a multi-level categoric design, or it's a split plot. With and without actual replication, we can you know, give you the best visual on that with these green triangles if you have pure error. And whether there's missing data or non-orthogonal levels, doesn't matter, we can handle it. So this, all these tools will make it easy for you to make better decisions to sort out the vital few effects from the trivial many. And I can see, uh, you know, that I'm going to run out of my one hour time here. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to suggest then at the end is that you just go ahead and email me questions. I'll take a look at the chat at the end and I'll get back to Mike, for example. And if I have your email in the chat, I can get back to you directly from the chat. I just wanted to mention as a postscript that on the graphical side of things, not to be overlooked are the scatter plots. And I showed you, for example, you know, the scatter plots um, for one of our examples. Um, the scatter plots are a good way to first look at the main effects of your factors before you get confused, you know, when you get into the actual analysis and start dealing with the half normal plot, the Pareto plot, the NOVA, all that. So I highly recommend using graphs. Um, one graph is worth a thousand numbers is kind of my saying. I don't think that's a Confucius saying, but I think it should have been. 
one graph is worth a thousand numbers. So go back and look at that. Uh, and I have a reference here just because I like looking at the history of how these things developed. And you know, the idea of scatter plots, of course, goes goes way, way back. So scatter plots are definitely useful. Um, if you're interested to see how these half normal plots are constructed, as I mentioned, uh, you might pick up this DOE Simplified book. This is a book that I'm the primary author of. And then there's more advanced books that get into response surface methods and mixture design. But the tools that I'm talking about in this presentation are covered in this first book, the DOE Simplified. They're available from Taylor and Francis. Uh, go to the um, Stati's website. You'll get a link uh, or go to uh, your favorite bookseller, whether it's Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or go to the Taylor and Francis sites and they have you know, different options there. They're available as eBooks also. Then if you really wanna get going on these tools, I highly recommend this modern DOE for process optimization. We have various public presentations. You can find it on our website or contact our workshops team. And this is um, five half day Zoom sessions. Um, you can also get specific uh, presentations to your own team. Um, and these can be somewhat customized as well which I would recommend if you have six or more people, then you can choose your own date and times and also get a little bit of customization, you know, in the case studies. So that's about it. Okay, I'm off now, but um, if you if you have any further questions, you've got my email, uh, mark at Take care now, bye-bye.